Hello, I'm Archie Luxury, and welcome to the program, fuckers. And today I'd like to look at why England no longer has a fucking car industry. And, um, you know, it, it's uh, five reasons. Number one, bad product. Shitty product that no one fucking wanted. Bad, unreliable, nasty products. Bad management, that's right. You're not inspired to make a great car when your boss is a prat, are you? Number three, bad unions. Nasty, lazy fuckers. The three-day week. The three-day week? Number four, bad, lazy workers. Unmotivated, lazy bludgers. And finally, number five, bad customers. Yes, you American fuckers, you were supposed to buy their shit that they were churning out. British Leyland built a whole fucking plant, 10 million pounds, to make the Triumph TR7, and you fuckers didn't buy it? You bastards! So let's, um, let's have a look at why England has no, no car industry at all. And uh, first thing we'll do is let's take a look at this skit on the British Union Movement. And uh, we'll see what these nasty fuckers have to say. We must examine the British character to understand their cars. The bowler hat is worn at all times, so headroom is essential. At weekends, the English chase the fox and shoot the grouse. For this, their cars must be sporty. Usually the British drive on the left, with one or two exceptions. Every year the British display themselves at a ceremony called Ascot, where horses and many curious costumes can be observed. Scotsmen are very attached to the skirt or kilt, also to money, so economy is important. Naturally the British love all animals. They even name their cars after their pets. Leyland make a great range of individual British cars. See your dealer for a free lesson in how to drive one. What's the hold up? One at a time. I'm sorry, Mr. Plummer, but these men cannot put this fitting onto those things. Why not? What's the matter with it? Oh, I stand to be corrected, of course, but I think I'm right in stating that this here is a combined tap and waste pipe control. That's right. What about it? So whose job is it to fit it in? What are you talking about? Ernie can do it, can't you, Ernie? Of course I can, Sid. Oh, no. Because Ernie is a tap fitter. Willie can do it, then. Oh, no. Because Willie, as you well know, is a waste pipe fitter. Right. Then they can both do it. Oh, no. Because if a tap fitter does it, that means he's doing a waste pipe fitter's job. If the waste pipe fitter does it, that means he's doing a tap fitter's job. Well, what the hell does it matter as long as they're both working? That's what I was saying. If you'll pardon me, you don't have a say. This is union business. Well, it is our union, isn't it? Exactly. And for that reason, you'll do as I bloody told you. Now, listen, under a redundancy agreement, dated March oh, 10th, 1969... All right, all right, we know all about that, but we're not making anybody redundant, are we? These men are doing their own jobs and each other's jobs in the same time. All right, Mr Spanner. What's your solution? It's not the union's job to give solutions. You can say that again. Mind you, just to show that I'm not trying to make difficulties, if you was to scrap this fitting and make two separate fittings for tap and waste pipe control... Impossible. That basin was made for only that one fitting. That's typical, that, isn't it? Isn't that typical? I offer them a solution and immediately they start making difficulties. Hang on, I got it. Suppose they work together. Ernie places the fitting in the hole, connects it to the inlet pipe, then Willie connects it to the outlet and does it up. How's that? You're missing the point, Mr Plummer. You've still got two men doing two men's jobs in the same time. Well? Which is the same as one man doing one man's job in after time. And what's wrong with that? Well, crikey. If every worker did his job in after time, the country would soon be in a right old mess, wouldn't it? Bernie? Now, wait a minute. You can't bring him out. I'm sorry. Until I acquaint the Union General Secretary with all the facts, you'll leave me no alternative. Everybody out! <laughs> British Leyland. They're wicked. They're more wicked than British Leyland. And the union movement. Man, they were so righteous in their rules and regulations that they decided to export all the fucking jobs to Bangladesh, China and India. You lazy fuckers don't want to work. We'll find someone who does. What do you reckon?
We'll find someone who does want to work. And uh, it's just a disaster. Absolute disaster. And uh, what can you say? I've got a... Uh, it's just so fucking sad. So sad. The British Union. What a mob of lazy fuckers. For 17 weeks, the speak strikers have poured through the factory gates at 11 a.m. every Thursday to collect their tax rebates. Yesterday, they did it for the last time. From Monday, they'll be back in making cars. All week, shop stewards have been cosseted with management to renegotiate the plans to speed up the track and to cut manning levels. But for the workers, the victory is a hollow one. The real fight, the fight to save the plant from closure, has only just begun. With the whole of Leyland on its knees, speak number two has become surplus to requirements. We're determined to fight it, even if it means sitting in there until the place closes down completely or until someone else takes over. We are determined that we'll sit in there in that factory and fight it right down the line. The car makers never really wanted to come to Merseyside in the first place. The traditional home of Standard Triumph had always been in Coventry. But then in 1959, under the strategy to relocate industry, the government twisted their arm and persuaded them to come up here to speak. For the next 10 years, they doubled the original workforce, turning out body shells for the Triumph Herald, the Vitesse, the 1300, and so on. And then in 1970, they built this, the now infamous Speak No. 2 plant, at a cost of £10.5 million. Pounds. It was one of the most modern and best equipped plants in Europe, designed to build more than 100,000 vehicles a year, all under one roof. At the time, it was very much an act of faith in the whole future of the motor industry here on Merseyside. Merseyside makes the Triumph TR7, a low-priced, wedge-shaped two-seater. The car was launched with even more than the usual ballyhoo to take America by storm. So, that was the dream, but the root causes of the problems in there are due to this. For speak number two plan, the decision to turn over almost the entire complex to the manufacturer of this one car was the beginning of the end. The TR7 was ill-conceived from the word go. It was aimed, after all, at the North American market. And the Americans can't resist an all-British, open, soft-top sports car in the grand tradition. So they made it a hard top. Purists say that it's a basically dishonest sort of design, meant to look like a nut market mid-engine car, but with very basic mechanics under the skin. Most people agree that from the front, it looks good. Not quite so hot from the side, and from the back, well, what do you think? When the great American dream went sour, the car was relaunched on the British market in May 1976. And since then, Leyland have been virtually giving the cars away. Financially, it's a flop. It hasn't sold in anything like the numbers they had hoped. Leyland admit that they've had many problems with what they call warranty. Well, that simply means new cars leaving the factory not properly screwed together. A common complaint has been the gearbox, and the Motor Magazine's own test car had to have a new one after 2,000 miles. And that was before the fan disintegrated, the wheel bearings went, and the boot lock fell out. America is adapting to the shape of things to come. Triumph TR7, with five-speed transmission or optional automatic, wide steel-belted radials, front disc brakes, front end spoiler, rack and pinion steering. Motor Trend calls it the best thing under five figures to come out of England in years. Triumph TR7, the shape of things to come, from British Leyland. All new designs have their teething troubles, and all models have their share of faults. But there seems to be something about the way the speak plant operates which affects the quality of the car. The management over the years, I think, have been very soft and they've let themselves get into a position where the, where the shop stewards virtually run the plant, where they are a pseudo-management. How do you mean? Well, I mean in the sense that uh, the managers could hardly move a foot without getting the agreement of the shop stewards through a splendid thing called the mutuality agreement. Uh, whose main purpose, it seems to me, was to stop the place being managed at all. And then there's the fact that uh, Speak is at the bottom of the league in so many ways. Uh, so the, the bottom of the Leyland League, that's saying a lot.
In what sort of ways? Well, uh, for example, if you take productivity. Leyland is not a high productivity company. Speak is at the bottom of the productivity league. It's only half as efficient as, say, Abingdon. Um, then you take a thing like absenteeism. Again, speak, top of the league. Uh, double the company average, more than double the company average overall. Mondays and Fridays, anywhere between 15 and 25 percent. Quality. Again, very low down in the company league. Again, in a company where quality is still, by its own estimates, 15, 10, 15 points behind the most efficient of the Japanese. Overmanning, 25% worse than the next Leyland plant. Now, all that adds up to a highly inefficient plant in a highly inefficient company, and you can make out a very good case for saying that Speak is one of the most inefficient car companies, not just in Leyland, but in the world. <laughs> 17 weeks on strike, and now the threat of total closure, have made the rift in relations between management and men even wider than it was. Almost every worker has a theory for what went wrong and who's to blame. This factory, brand new factory, oh, it's all brand new. But where did the managers come from? Cast-offs from Coventry and, and bloody Long Bridge and all them places. That's all, that's all that's happened. Well, you tell him. You tell him. You tell him. You've got the floor. I'm talking about bloody productivity. I'm getting bloody engines up here that we've got to work on. Well, come over and let's get them. We've got gearboxes that we've got to work on before we can put them in a bloody car. Axles, the bloody We've got axles that we've got to work on before we can put them in a bloody car. We've even got bloody engine bloody bolts that we've got to send out locally to be plated before we can put them in a bloody car. And they're, up, and they're accusing this plant, they're accusing this plant of lack of productivity. What can we do to quote Winston Churchill's bloody words? Give us the truth and we do the bloody job. This car is a disgrace. It never sold, and all the management don't say the greatest export that you've ever had from Leyland. And it didn't. It's a load of bloody rubbish, that car. It is one load of bloody rubbish. And all Edwards can do. Uh, uh... Every car in its class. At Charlotte, Ridgehampton, Pocono, Lime Rock, and Westwood. The TR7 combines comfort, luxury, handling, and performance in a way that leaves the competition way behind. If you're after a real sports car, drive a winner. Triumph's TR7 Spoker at your British Leyland dealers now. Uh, it's a disgrace. It never sold. And all the management don't say the greatest export that you've ever had from Leyland. And it didn't. It's a load of bloody rubbish, that car. It is. One load of bloody rubbish. And all Edwards can do. Uh, uh... This Allegro is the best car I've ever owned. It's got to hold five people in comfort, mind, and do naught to 60 in about nine seconds. Well, even they got to watch the petrol, haven't they? Five-speed gearbox, adjustable steering wheel, not as extras. And I must be able to lock all the doors at the flick of a switch. Slow down, Neville, there's a fire. And five doors and reclining seats. Can't help me, of course, can you? The new Rover 3500, sir. Leyland Cars. Austin, MG, Triumph, Mini, Jaguar, Daimler, Princess, Morris, Rover. All with super cover. Great cars and a great deal more. You know, he's got as much cut as his height. It's a five foot, and that's how much got he got. There was times where they've had to send down the commentary, which is dickhead, but excuse me, this is where they've had soft things come. There was one time there in the uh, TR7, they had 5,000 left-hand wings for the front ends, yeah. and they sent down to commentary for 5,000 right hands, and what happens? They sent 5,000 left hands up, yeah. and now that laid us off for three days, that, through stupid management, for us now to do with us, but it's just gone on time and time again. But it's gone beyond a joke now. Hasn't there been very high absenteeism, 25%? There is, yeah, I agree. On Mondays and Fridays? I agree. There's never been 25%. No, 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 no,
It comes mainly from troubles in the motor industry and the docks, neither exactly famed for industrial harmony and lack of strikes. People talk about the so-called Merseyside disease, the idea that somehow people here don't work as hard as in other parts of Britain. I think it dates back this to, like our granddads and, and grandfathers, of, of the time when they were on the dock standing in pens. It's just a, a thing that they hate management. They don't really hate them, but it dates back to that time. You know, when, when you were picked, if your face fitted or you'd work for less money. I, I, think, I think all this dates back to this sort of, sort of time. That even if you work, say, in Tesco's, you still have a little thing about the management, you know? Take a look at this uh, this British Leyland plant at Speak. Go, go and have a talk to the, the men who work there. And you can soon see why we don't have a British car industry. And uh, all I can say is good riddance to bad rubbish. That's right. If you don't want to fucking put your, put your effort into your workmanship, you don't want to make a good fucking product, well, no one's going to buy your shit. And uh, it serves you bludges right. And uh, you got no one to blame except yourself. I'm Archie Luxury. Tell me what you fuckers think. Yeah, it's a disgrace. It never sold. And all the management don't say the greatest export that you've ever had from Leyland. And it didn't. It's a load of bloody rubbish, that car. It is. One load of bloody rubbish. And all Edwards can do. Uh, uh... America is coming home in the shape of things to come. Triumph's bold slashing wedge, TR7, at a bold slashing price, $49.95. Triumph TR7, the shape of things to come. At a price you can afford today, $49.95. A right to work campaign is all right. But I don't think they can have a right to work when you feel like it campaign because unfortunately in the big league that does not work. They're not playing in, in, in the Merseyside and District Football League. They're playing in a very, very tough world league. I mean, just take uh, the biggest Japanese importer into this com uh, country, uh, Datsun. Uh, they have had no strike or stoppage of any of their assembly lines for other than mechanical reasons for 20 years, and neither, what's more, have any of their component suppliers. Now that's the league these boys have been playing in, and I'm afraid they've not been playing the kind of game that keeps you in that league. It just brings relegation, and sometimes it kills the club, and I'm afraid that's what's happened. Leyland are adamant that speak number two must die if the rest of their operation and the other 120,000 jobs up and down the country are to be saved. So there might be a certain irony in the original choice of the location for the plant next to a cemetery. And for the choice of code name for the whole TR7 project, it's known as the bullet. they have this curious habit of driving on the right, George? Yes, sir. I think I'd better drive now, George. She 
is powerful, isn't she? It's a 2.2 litre six cylinder engine, sir. Listen to that, George. What? What is it, sir? The silence. If you're frightened, get in the back, George. She's very smooth, George. Hydrogas suspension, sir. This is a marvellous new car, George. As with all our cars, it's a Leyland, like the Jaguar, sir. Oh là là, merci. Vous allez à Paris? Oui, nous y serons dans une heure, une heure et quart. I didn't know you spoke French, George. Well, you know it now, Archibald.